course, I am your host, Christopher Brown. While we traditionally focus on local governance issues, we recognize the importance of the broader political landscape on municipal affairs. That's why, here on this show, we have decided to sit down with federal, provincial, and territorial leaders to delve into their perspectives on municipal governance and how their levels of government are addressing municipal concerns. Today's guest is the Honorable Kathleen Ganley, the current MLA for Calgary Mountain View and former Attorney General of the province of Alberta, and currently running to be the next leader of the Alberta NDP. In our one-on-one -on -one interview, we will discuss her leadership aspirations, her vision for Alberta's future, and perhaps most importantly for our audience and for myself, her visions for municipalities across the province, both urban and rural. This is Municipal Affairs. Kathleen, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting the sort of the first question off the bat before we get into the crux of the interview. And you're you're running for the leadership of the Alberta NDP. Why you? Why now? Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, and that is a great question. Uh, so why do I think it should be me? I think because, uh, you know, I have uh, the experience building the team. And I think that's really one of the things we need to do. We've done a really good job under Rachel of like building up our team. But I think there's been some growing pains, right, at Alberta's NDP. Uh, I think we've had, you know, some challenges of, you know, communication processes and people feeling a little not included, people feeling like local knowledge is a little bit disregarded. Um, and so I've I've rolled a member's charter to talk about that because I think our our greatest strength is going out to the doors and talking to people. And we have hundreds of volunteers across the province. That's how you change minds is by talking to people directly. And I think we do a really good job of it. I think we could just maybe take it up a notch, build a movement, have some members only events with maybe some speakers and make people feel a little more part of something. Um, and then I think we talk about the economy. I think what we didn't do the best job of was making an economic offer to people in the last election. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm talking about why we're better on the economy. Um, we sometimes cede this space to the right. And I don't know why we do that because their idea is giving more to those who are very, very rich, uh, you know, having no environmental regulations for companies, paying companies to clean up messes that are their legal obligation. Um, those aren't ideas that are good for the economy. Whereas our ideas, you know, making sure that everyone has a basic living, making sure that everyone can earn a decent living wage so that they have money to spend in the local economy. Those are ideas that are better. So I so for transparency's sake, for anyone who watches this show, I should note that my husband, Ricardo Miranda, and Kathleen served alongside each other during the Rachel Notley government from 2015 to 2019 and in cabinet from 2016 to 2019. He did join cabinet a year after they got elected. So I just want to put that on the record, as I always do in these interviews. But I want to ask, what makes your economic plan better than Danielle Smith's economic plan? Yeah, so I would say a couple of different things, right? So right now, the UCP is running around crowing about how great the economy is. But I think, ask yourself, like, who do you know that feels that? Who do you know that isn't struggling to pay their electricity, to pay their mortgage, to buy their groceries? Uh, I think most people are. So uh, what I think is better about our ideas on the economy is that when we look at the economy, we say, how is this working for everyone? Not how is it working for the top 5%? How is it working for overseas shareholders? We ask, how is it working for everyone? Um, and I think we put forward some really solid proposals. So ending price gouging in the electricity system. Um, what that is, is just like everyday people and small businesses having to pay more so that large incumbent generators can generate massive profits and send those profits to their shareholders, right? I'm not saying that business shouldn't profit. I understand the, the purpose of business is exactly that, to profit. Uh, but at a certain point, like we regulate price gouging, right? And there's a, a reason for that. Um, you know, when, when someone must have a product, um, you can't use a shortage of supply to essentially hold them hostage and make them hand over their life savings. We don't let that happen and we shouldn't. Um, you know, another one that we're putting forward is about ensuring that we get a proper scoping of inactive well liability. Right now, there are no rules at all around um, around 
when timelines when companies have to clean up so you have all these landowners that have you know these wells on their property that are not producing no rent is being paid for them there's nothing they can do about it and they could be leaking anything into their environment and there's there's no way for them to change that so um we're just talking about making sure that that incredible wealth and opportunity that we have here in alberta can be shared by everyone so as as I preface on this show, we are the municipal show. We talk about municipal issues across this province, and we focus on the municipal affairs of this great province of Alberta. So I'm going to talk to you about some municipal issues, and I want to start by the big one over the last two weeks. Premier Smith, alongside Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs Rick McIver, rolled out Bill 18, the Alberta Priorities uh, Act, if you will, which would stop municipalities from working with the federal government and the provincial government would, would be have to be involved in that negotiation process between municipalities and the federal government. Were you taken back by this? Because when I speak to municipal leaders, I don't hear this as a concern that they have. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's a concern anyone has. I mean, this is like the thing about Danielle Smith, isn't it? Uh, it's a series of bills and ideas that no one was asking for, like the Alberta Pension Plan or the Alberta Provincial Police, or uh, they have Bill 17 actually creates their own research institute because they can't get support for their abstinence only model from any actual research. So they need to create their own institute and then direct it to come up with the findings that they want. Um, so, yeah, I would say that Bill 18 is just another example of a bill that no one was asking for. Um, it's in there because Danielle Smith wants to be in charge of everything, right? Her entire premise is a war against the federal government. Like, this is a government that is, like, completely uninterested in actually governing the province. All they care about is taking power and yelling at the federal government, um, and they're basically upset that the federal government was like, look, we want more housing. So we're going to work with municipalities because they want more housing, too. Um, and I guess the province has decided to interfere because they want it done their way or no way at all. So how would a relationship between the municipalities and a Alberta NDP led by Kathleen Ganley look? Um, it would look a lot different, right? I think you get a lot farther when you are respectful of people, right? This is a government that has essentially said to municipalities, like, we don't care. We don't care what you think. We don't care what your priorities are. Um, and bear in mind, like, you know, the, the irony of the title is like kind of delightful, right? It's like provincial priorities. But I'm like, that's not really true, right? Like, these aren't the priorities of the majority of Albertans at all, um, they're the they're they're the priorities of the UCP and specifically the UCP who has kind of been taken over by Take Back Alberta, right? So they're like the the priorities of a minority of a minority. Um, and look, municipal politicians are politicians too. They're not going to act counter to the interests of the majority of the people they represent, or much like any other politician, they will be shown the door, right? So. Um, this idea that somehow municipal politicians don't care about what people think is itself extremely problematic, right? A lot of them are a lot closer on the ground. A lot of them are like living in those communities every day. And it's very rich for someone like Danielle Smith, who doesn't even live in her own riding, uh, <laughs> to say this, right? So when you when I speak to municipal leaders across this province, whether it be the smallest village or the largest city, there's an undercurrent theme that comes up on every single discussion I have, and that is infrastructure. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure is the name of the game when it comes to municipalities. Alberta municipalities recently did a survey and they anticipate almost $30 billion of infrastructure deficits in their communities. Um, they've asked for this government, uh, alongside Rick McIver, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, to increase LGFF. This last budget did not do that. Do you see yourself being a more stronger supporter for infrastructure funding for municipalities if you are elected leader, but also as premier, if you get the chance? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we see need to see it as infrastructure for communities, right? Because it's not just for the municipality, it's for the people that live in that community. So what 
um, municipal leaders are doing is they're bringing forward the concerns of the people in their communities. So, um, yeah, I think like we see an underinvestment in infrastructure across the board from this government, right? They just canceled a much needed hospital in Edmonton. Uh, they uh, are, are building way too few schools, right? Like it's really bad here in Calgary. Uh, it's even worse in, in Rocky View, the surrounding county. So places like Airdrie and Chestermere that are growing incredibly quickly. Um, you know, right now we have, um, we have kids learning on the gym stage, right? Uh, the, the minister of education actually went to do the announcement on like, we're funding all these schools and the school he went to in Airdrie, they had to take all the bookshelves and the books out of storage to make the library look a lot like a library again, because they had to move all those kids to turn those into classrooms. Right. So like, they're just, um, they seem like fundamentally uninterested and like people, if we want a thriving rural economy, we need to make sure that services are where people live. Like people don't necessarily make decisions like they get a job and they go to that community anymore. You know, young people these days are often looking at what life is like in that community, right? So they care if there's a community theater space, they care if there's a community center, they care if there's a recreation center, right? Like those are things that are, important uh for people and if we want to keep our economy growing we need to invest in those things you, you talk about rural and i was going to talk about this a little bit later but let, let, let's play in the sandbox for a bit um one of the concerns that you hear when i speak to rural reeves counselors is rural access to rural health care it is a priority for a lot of rural municipalities because we are seeing ER closures, we are seeing clinics closures because we don't have the proper staff to staff these units. And that means that families who might have a sick child will have to drive three and a half, four hours to the closest ER or doctor. How do you see yourself investing or how do you have any priorities around rural healthcare to ensure that we do have adequate funding and adequate staff to staff the clinics that we already have in place besides building new hospitals, which is great, but let's staff the hospitals that we have here as well. <laughs> yeah. So my healthcare plan sort of starts with investment in primary care, right? And I do think that we need a specific strategy to attract primary care into rural areas. We had done that in the past and we did a not half bad job of it. The problem is under the UCP, like first under Kenny, they attacked family physicians right before a pandemic. Um, and then they haven't changed the compensation model to recognize the way doctors practice, right? So they're like way behind. They're trying to force everyone into 10 minute medicine and people don't want to practice that way. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, another big part is like attracting nurses, right? And we actually have a lot of nurses. You would be surprised at the number of doors I knock on where people younger than me say, I used to be a nurse. Um, and they have left that profession voluntarily. It's not that they've retired. Um, it's that they didn't feel like they could provide the, the patient care that was necessary and that like moral injury um, has has driven them to make a different choice with their lives. And I think that that's really sad. So I think we start by investing in primary care. We fix the compensation model. That still doesn't give us enough primary care physicians right now. Um, assuming about like running off roughly a metric of about 1,200 patients a doctor. But, and this was something we proposed in the last election. It's just nobody heard about it because I don't think we sold it quite right. Um, so our family health teams include using physicians, assistants, and nurse practitioners and having folks work in a team. That would mean that each family doctor can take about 1,800 patients. Uh, and so that gives way more people access to a family doctor. And I think that what we should have said is to set our goal and then create policy that supports it. We should have said, you will have a family doctor. You will be able to get in for urgent issues within three days. Uh, that is what we should have said, because that's what people are interested in, right? They're interested in timely access, because access that isn't timely, having to book, you're like, you have a, you know, really sore throat, you want to go to the doctor, you, an appointment in two weeks doesn't help you, you're going to wind up in the emergency, obviously. Um, so we need to give people that access. So that decongests it on one end. I think on the other end, we invest in long-term care and in home care, because there are people in long-term care that would rather be at home, but they can't access home care. Um, and when we do that, it decongests it from the other end. 
And what that gives us is kind of more of a, a clear line of sight into what's wrong with, with the system. And then we can go ahead and fix it from there, right? Our healthcare system has been under strain for a lot of years. Um, when Would we you were in say government, that even under the NDP government, under Rachel Notley, and while you were in cabinet, it was under pressure? Yes. Uh, so what I think we did a good job of when we were in government, we were in record low oil prices and we didn't respond the way past governments have. So we didn't cut funding to healthcare and education. We kept them funded. But that was it was a very um, station keeping isn't quite the right word. But do you know what I mean? It was a very like we managed to keep it functioning through difficult circumstances. But I wouldn't say that we did an enormous amount to reform it. Um, I think that this time I would make that a priority um, is doing some things to reform it. Um, you know, I think a government can only do so many things at a time. So you have to kind of pick your priorities, if you will. Um, and I think, um, you know, what we prioritized was sort of stabilizing healthcare and education. And I think we did a good job of that. Uh, but in future, I would like to think, I mean, Look, by the time we get back in in 2027, there'll probably be a lot to be stabilized again. But uh, I, I think we can also start to make some forward progress. One of the one of the priorities that you have put out there, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is to reform AER. So I have spoken to Paul McLaughlin, president of RMA, on a lengthy basis around the proper unpaid property tax bills that oil and gas companies have failed to pay municipalities. They are calling them zombie creatures, and he they're not saying that all oil and gas companies are doing this. They are saying just a few negligible or companies are not paying their property taxes. Why is reforming the AER so important for yourself to ensure that the viability of the oil and gas sector is good for the long term? Yeah, so fundamentally, it's about fairness, right? Like Danielle Smith's solution to this problem is to let those companies off the hook for taxes that they owe to municipalities. Well, that isn't fair to those municipalities, right? It's just asking someone else to foot the bill. Um, their other solution is to take $20 billion in taxpayer money from you know, families who are really struggling to pay their rent already um, and give that to corporations to clean up messes that are already their own liability. Um, so I think it's important for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that we need to restore some fairness. Like the rules are, in my view, fairly egregious at this moment, right? Like the rules around which, so often what happens is there's a well, the well produces, and then when it sort of stops producing and nobody knows exactly what the curve down is going to look like, they sell it to a small company, but the small company does not have the finances to take on the liability and they do a terrible job of assessing that so essentially what happens is all these wells these big companies make a massive profit off these wells they sell them on to these small companies who either make a ton of money or if the well doesn't produce they just go under and then the liability vests to the taxpayer right so that's like it's really not Fair. It's allowing companies to take the profits and run, essentially. And I don't, I don't think that's fair to the people of Alberta. And right now, because there are no rules around when you have to abandon. So like abandonment is kind of a process. You have to like ab abandon an inactive well, um, say like the company's gone bankrupt, you plug it up, that sort of thing. There are no rules around that. So we have inactive wells all over the province that technically belong to a company somewhere. They're not producing. They're not paying rent to the landowner. They're probably not paying their taxes either. Um, and there, there's no timeline to say, like, you have to shut it down at some point. They can just leave it like that. Um, so that's very, very problematic because it doesn't essentially the money goes away, right? So the company makes a ton of money off the well, and then they spend that money in other places or they give it to shareholders or they do whatever they do with it. And then, you know, 20 years later, this well is still there and they're like, oh, whoops, we don't have any money anymore. Well, that's not a good thing. So I think it's just about restoring fairness, right? And I think there are a lot of landowners that have been fighting for a really long time to have this recognized as an issue. Because if you're an individual landowner who has one of these things on their land, there is very little recourse for you.
I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you the political question on the political show about political things. Okay. But um, Alberta Municipalities President Tyler Gandum says that the recall legislation as presented has been weaponized against municipal leaders. He just went through an unsuccessful recall petition. The mayor of Calgary, we're still waiting for final numbers, but it looks like that is not going to fail as well. The mayor of Medicine Hat, Denalda, has gone through one. High Prairie just this week. Onaway has gone through is going through three recall petitions for the mayor, deputy mayor, and council. Um, do you support this recall legislation? And if you are elected, would you be in favor of overturning it or refining it to ensure that it does not get politicized as Alberta municipalities president Tyler Gandum says it has? So I'm going to disagree a little bit. I don't think it was politicized. I think it was always intended to be politicized. Like the process that you have to undergo, like, I mean, you're familiar with what door knocking is like and how hard it is to get the vote out. Right. Um, the process is next to impossible to succeed in. No matter how unpopular the politician, the process is next to impossible. To the barrier is incredibly high, as well it should be. But I think that that's a really big clue that the UCP never intended this legislation to be successful. What they intended it to be is legislation that can be used to harass politicians. In particular, um, it will be used to harass politicians who aren't sort of, um, wow, who are female or racialized or indigenous or uh, disabled or any other number of things, right? It, it's essentially, I don't think it was ever intended to recall anyone. I think it was intended to allow, you know, the far right, like Take Back Alberta, to harass politicians they don't agree with into shutting up. That's a big statement, though, because you're saying that it's it's not used for its intended purpose. It's just to quash any dissent among Albertans. Is that what you're saying? I just want to make sure I'm getting that right here. Yes, I believe it's the political uh, equivalent of a of a slap lawsuit. Uh, I think it's intended to like over just essentially harass people into submission, right? Like what this does is it weakens our democracy, and it is very much my belief that people at the extremes, um, and I'll ex I'll include the left in this. Unfortunately, I wish I didn't have to, but I do. But I think the far right is much worse, much worse for this. Um, people at the extremes are are very loud and they want to to shout at people, right? Um, and yeah, I think that this is legislation that essentially gives them a platform to harass politicians, right? And in some cases, right, in the case of something like Take Back Alberta, this is very much in their interest, right? Because the more there is screaming in politics, the more people in the middle are kind of forced to see the space, right? They still have their views, but they're not going to engage in the conversation because they don't want to engage in that kind of conversation. So, yeah, I mean, it's always been my view that this recall legislation was never intended to be democratic. It was just intended to be um, another means by which uh, people who aren't historically represented in politics, i.e. anyone that isn't a straight white male, um, get harassed. The other issue that municipalities, especially Alberta municipalities, have been advocating is the stop of the introduction of political parties into the municipal realm. Um, we all see it coming. The premier has sort of uh, alleged that it's going to be coming this spring. We're going to probably be seeing it in the next few weeks from what I understand. Um, are you in favor of the introduction of political parties into uh, municipal governance? I am not. No, I don't think that that's helpful. And I think, again, this is an answer to a question that no one has asked, right? No one is asking for this. I have met with countless municipal leaders in my time in government and opposition. No one has ever asked me for this. Uh, and so, yeah, I just think this is a government, again, sort of pursuing their own agenda rather than, you know, doing what, what people think is important. I don't think I've ever had a private citizen approached me about wanting political parties in municipal elections, right? Um, I assume this is the UCP trying to get in there and because their model works on 
um, what I would say, like their model works on like people emotionally identifying as conservative, right? So they're like, we're conservatives. Um, and what they are not liking about municipal politics is that people talk about their values, right? And when people talk about their values, you're more likely to get an outcome that is more progressive. So um, yeah, I think this is the UCP once again, pursuing their own agenda rather than answering a question that anyone had asked. <laughs> So you've been in the MLA for three terms now, first in uh, office from 2015 to 2019 as a cabinet minister, but now as a member of the opposition, you represent a more urban community, uh, well, urban downtown center of Calgary Mountain View. How does someone like yourself connect with someone in a rural small town, say of Onaway, say of Wembley, Alberta, or even high level? How does someone who has the background of a lawyer represent the people in these smaller communities? Uh, yeah, so I think um, I, I often tell people, I'm like, I wish I could tell you there was a magic bullet, but the truth is the answer is hard work. Uh, the answer is going out there and talking to folks and not just talking at them, but genuinely engaging, taking their questions, listening to what they have to say, and like really internalizing that information. Because in my experience, it's often the same in, you know, um, mid-sized cities or in rural municipalities, like the, the values are actually the same. They're generally more progressive values. They care about ensuring that everyone has access to an economy that works about for them. They care about ensuring that, you know, our kids have a world-class education. They care about making sure that all of our loved ones have access to healthcare when they need it. Um, but the context is different, right? So whereas in the city, the problem we're having is that our, our classrooms are overcrowded to bursting, right? We don't have enough infrastructure. We don't have enough teachers. We don't have enough EAs. Um, in a rural setting, they may be having the opposite problem. So because the enrollment is lower, um, you know, they have one teacher for three grades. And that means that when kids are preparing for university, if they want to take an option like French, or they want to take an option like um, computer science, like they're, um, they don't have access to specialist teachers in those environments necessarily. So we need to come up with a different solve, right? So it's like same values, different contexts. So I think we have to go out there, we learn, we listen to what people have to say and we like genuinely engage. I think we also need to build a movement. And I mean, this gets way down into the weeds, right? But uh, we need to support our rural riding associations to be able to have events, right? Like the where I've seen this done really well, and this is mid-sized city, not rural, but um, like if you go down to Lethbridge, right? When, when you have an NDP event, like I did a town hall, there were like 130, 140 people there. Um, everybody knows each other, right? They're all engaged. Oh, hi, nice to see you. It's like a social event, right? And so if we can build that, if we can build that community for people, more progressives and more progressives will come out. The truth is in rural communities, we took, um, like in everything outside Calgary and Edmonton, we took close to a third of the vote. That's not actually bad. Like that's a significant improvement for us. We have no idea who those people are. They're not in our database. We don't know anything about them, right? But they are our supporters. So we have to figure out how to get out there and talk to them. So I, I, I know I have a short period of time here. So I have one last question before I wrap up here. And that is around crime. And as the former Attorney General, Justice Minister of this province, I would not be doing my job if I didn't ask you this. Uh, during the last provincial election, Alberta Municipalities was calling on more supports for municipalities around crime, around officers. As the former Attorney General, as the former Justice Minister, do you see the province needing to do more? And do you see yourself wanting to do more in addressing some of the rural crime issues that municipalities are plagued with right now? Yeah, so I do see myself wanting to do a lot more, but I want to say that that more has to start with housing. It has to start with supportive, affordable housing. Uh, and in fact, I spent a lot of time talking to the Association of Chiefs of Police uh, here in Alberta, and every one of those chiefs of police will tell you that the most cost effective investment that you can make in public safety is permanent supportive housing. Um, 
they all know that they all believe that they all lobby for that right so the UCP government cut that so we do have to start there now in the interim we have a big problem right um I think that problem is not addressed just by officers but by teams of officers paired with social workers right because the problem is many of our systems um have broken down particularly under the UCP I think we see um their their poor performance on mental health addictions and housing as files is on the streets around us every day um like that is the provincial government's fault um and they're doing very little to fix it so i think like when all other systems break down people wind up with the police not because the police want to respond, not because those people necessarily want the police to respond, but because when you call the police, they are legally obligated to turn up. Uh, and so you wind up with things like mental health, like addictions, like homelessness being managed by police, and that's not good for anyone. And it's expensive, right? Like, boy, is it expensive. The cost of housing someone in permanent supportive housing is much cheaper than the cost of housing them in jail, but we make the wrong choices on that all the time. So I think, yeah, I think, yes, they need to in invest in, you know, police social work pairings, in my view. Um, I think what we did in government on rural crime was actually quite effective, that intelligence-based model, which, um, you know, from the RCMP themselves, <laughs> another outfit that the provincial government doesn't seem to like very much. Um, so those things are really important. But like we... The UCP doesn't want us to have supervised consumption. Um, but the thing is, we do have supervised consumption sites here in Calgary. They're the middle car of the C-train. Uh, and that's not in anyone's interest. It means that our kids can't ride the C-train. It means that, you know, that workers, transit workers who are trained to be transit workers are having to deal with medical emergencies that are extremely traumatic for them. Uh, it's just, it's a terrible, it's a terrible system that the UCP has set up. And when you have the wrong agencies addressing the problem, it's always going to cost more and it's always going to do a bad job. So I have one last question for you, but before I ask the question, I'm going to just say this. Uh, to learn more about Kathleen Ganley's campaign and get involved and buy a membership before midnight on Monday, April 22nd, the links are in the show notes. So scroll down and buy a membership if you want and check her out on social media, reach out to her campaign. But my final question to you before I let you go is this final one, and that is, how does a Ganley Alberta differ from a Smith Alberta? Oh boy, that's a big question. Uh, let me start with the high level. Uh, it's a government that is focused on people, uh, on what people need, right? Right now we have a government that is focused on crass political politics. I also think um, it would be a government that is focused on governing. Um, I would say the difference between the NDP, and I would say this of all our current leadership candidates uh, and the UCP, the difference is, is that we would like to win in order to govern. The UCP just wants to win and they sort of govern as a side effect and they don't do it particularly well. Um, so actually governing, actually addressing problems, actually caring about people and what we can do for people, I would say that that is the biggest difference and it will manifest um, in a myriad of ways from the economy to healthcare to education. Kathleen, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Before we let you go, I should know that for transparency's sake, my husband, one of the producers of this show, the Honorable Ricardo Miranda, served alongside Kathleen Ganley in Rachel Notley's cabinet from 2015 to 2019. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, 
stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.